some of the argument for common descent in more recent times has gone away from the fossil record and to the genetic record. And so the argument has been, well, we see evidence for common descent in the genetic record, specifically shared vestigial DNA or junk DNA. I know the ENCODE project has created some trouble for that approach. So tell me about junk DNA and does this prove evolution? Well, you know, if there were, in, in, in the concept of junk DNA, just to take a step back, is this idea that when we look at the human genome, in fact, the genomes of, of other organisms, most of the genomes appear to be littered with non-functional DNA that people interpret as being the vestiges of an evolutionary history. And, the, and so the question is, well, why would a creator produce genomes of organisms that are littered with non DNA. That doesn't make any sense. And if you think of human beings as the crown of creation, and yet our genomes consist of, again, you know, 95% junk DNA, that just doesn't make sense. But even more problematic is the idea that some of the so-called junk DNA sequences in our genome are shared with chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas. And so the argument goes, well, this is clearly an indication that we must have shared an evolutionary history where the mechanisms that produce that junk DNA uh, occurred in, you know, evolutionary in the evolutionary ancestor, and then those features were retained in our genomes as we diverged, you know, separately along different evolutionary lineages. And so they argue the only way to make sense of junk DNA, uh, and particularly shared junk DNAs in, in, a, in an evolutionary context, and I actually would agree with that. Uh, that if indeed that it, that's true, then I think it's a very powerful case for common mm -hmm. descent. The, the problem here is that uh, we have learned that most of the classes, if not all of the classes of junk DNA are actually functional. And uh, on top of that, we're discovering that uh, the vast proportion of the human genome, thanks to the ENCODE project, which you mentioned, indicates that probably most of the genetic elements in our genome play some kind of functional role. There's a very low level of, of sequences in our genome that you could rightly be understood as being non-functional. Uh, and, and so uh, if that's the case, then you could argue, well, if these, these functional sequences uh, are indicating that there's a rationale to every feature of the human genome consistent with the handiwork of a creator, and we could see those shared features as reflecting common design as opposed to common descent. And in fact, we are now learning um, uh, that there are, there's even reasons why, for example, certain classes of junk DNA look the way they look, that, 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 they, they, that their features that they possess that are interpreted as, as vestiges of an evolutionary history are actually necessary for their functional role. So it's not only that these sequences are functional, but we can explain why these sequences are the way they are and why they bear similarities, like for the, in the case of pseudogenes, why they bear similarities to quote unquote functional genes. Or I'm just about to write an article about endogenous retroviruses and making the point that these retro, endogenous retroviruses actually are playing a, a, an antiviral role where they're protecting our bodies against retroviral infections. And the, the way they do it is through the, the features that they possess that are similar to retroviruses. So in other words, we can now see the genome is rightly understood as, as being, again, reflecting design where the shared features could be understood as common design, not common descent. Uh, and, and this is not just an ad hoc explanation. <laughs> Interestingly enough, prior to Darwin, uh, biologists were aware of shared biological features that organisms displayed. Now, of course, these were not genetic features, these were anatomical and physiological features. Uh, but they interpreted those features as, again, reflecting an archetype that existed in the mind of a creator that was then functionally manifested in the created order. And so what Darwin did is when he proposed this theory of evolution is he took the concept of an archetype and he evolutionized it so that the archetype now becomes, in effect, a, a common ancestor. Uh, and so, so prior to Darwin, people saw shared features as reflecting common design. After Darwin, people see shared features as reflecting common descent. 
But the bottom line is that both explanations are valid, scientifically speaking, and the common design explanation has a rich history in biology prior to Darwin. So as you were speaking, something hit me, and it's about the predictive capacity of evolution. Obviously, good scientific theory needs to be able to make predictions. And if evolution were true, it would predict a tremendous amount of junk DNA. I mean, obviously, that would be a prediction that you might make. And so as the ENCODE project finds out, hey, maybe this sequence doesn't code for a new protein, but it's regulatory and it's governing how things happen or something like that. As we're finding out that so-called junk DNA isn't junk DNA, it's undoing that prediction of evolution. And in fact, it might be something that a predictive model like your own would predict. When we have a predictive creationism model, we would predict that there wouldn't be junk DNA, that it would be there for a reason. So maybe we're finding through the ENCODE project that the predictive capacity of a creationism, creationism model like yours is much higher than for evolution. Am I right on that? Nate, that's a, an excellent point. I'm so glad that you brought that up and, you know, very insightful comments on your part. Um, you know, I, I can remember when I started working with Reasons to Believe, it was o over uh, 21, 22 years ago. Uh, one of the first articles I wrote for Reasons to Believe, which would go back to 1999, the summer of 1999, was uh, an article about suggesting a functional role for junk DNA. And at mm -hmm. that point in time, there was literally nothing that we could really say in response to the junk DNA argument. And I, I after writing that article, or at, the, or at the end of the article, I made the prediction that eventually we will discover function for junk DNA. <laughs> if, if the creation so that is model the predictive was, capacity yes, right there. Right. And so, you know, and this was, you know, before the, the human genome was sequenced, you know, this was, again, in my yeah. one of my earliest thing earliest things that I wrote for reasons to believe, and the truth be told, at that time I do, could not even envision how we could ever discover function for pseudogenes or endogenous retroviruses. It was a prediction I made based on this is what the model demanded, but privately I was wondering if that prediction would ever be truly satisfied. And lo and behold, I've seen in the last twenty years. The, this prediction being, you know, satisfied time and time and time again. And it, it, again, the ENCODE project is, is revolutionary because as you rightly point out, uh, it flies in the face of what you would expect from an evolutionary standpoint. In fact, I've had debates and conversations with people that are evolutionary biologists and it come, when the ENCODE project comes up, I'm oftentimes told this, that if indeed I'm sorry, I, I made a misstatement. I'm told this, that if, uh, if it, that ENCODE cannot be correct, the results of the ENCODE project cannot be correct, because if it was, it means that key aspects of the evolutionary paradigm are incorrect. And so mm -hmm. this is like a bizarro world way of thinking about science, where instead of the data evaluating a theory, the theory is evaluating the data. And if the data doesn't match the theory, then then the, the, they're casting aspersions on the quality of the study or even the competence of the people that are doing the work on the ENCODE project. And this has actually ignited something that uh, science journalist Carl Zimmer has called the junk DNA wars, where you have people working in genomics, particularly human genomics, that see ENCODE as being incredibly valuable in giving important insight into our human biology that they're using to understand disease and even using it as a way to suggest therapeutic approaches to treating diseases. And then you have evolutionary biologists who are rejecting ENCODE or questioning ENCODE because of, again, a, the, the implications of, of the ENCODE project, if indeed it is correct, that things like, that things like you know, junk D, the, the junk DNA concept no longer makes sense. And that's really problematic in an evolutionary uh, framework. So we are going to conclude the interview in a little while with a question about philosophy. I think you and I both would agree that evolution is a lot more philosophical than most evolutionists would want to admit. 
when I took chemistry classes, we couldn't get away with any of this stuff. I mean, my my biochem profs, my ochem profs, my pchem prof, <laughs> these guys and gals would not let me get away with anything like this. Our, our, our math had to be perfect. Everything had to be perfect. And we had to explain everything. You remember in ochem, those pages and pages and pages of reaction mechanisms. And if you just said, oh, it just happened and it just is, uh, you'd fail it. You'd, you'd, be, you'd be done with the class. But here, a philosophy is dictating that response to the science. It's kind of sad. We'll get to that question about philosophy later. I just, I'm just enthralled with this idea, though, that creationism is a better predictive model than evolution. Because as a scientist, that's kind of the holy grail. That's what you're aiming for. And uh, I believe the evidence for creationism is greater than for evolution. But this predictive quality is exciting, too. And we saw it there.